everyone, welcome to the next episode of our vlog. We're on episode four now, and this time I actually had quite a few questions to answer, mainly to elaborate on things that I would have touched on in previous episodes and kind of more details people want in terms of certain areas. If you want to make sure that you get any further updates, make sure that you come and subscribe and like the page so that it means that if the next episode comes out, you won't miss it, that you'll get a notification on it. So very useful feature. And if you have any questions or if there's something that you'd like to know a little bit more about, then just drop a comment down here and we try to gather them up and answer them in future episodes. Like ideally what works very well is that if there's particular topics that go well together, we can kind of group questions so that they make sense as a, kind of as a subject for that particular day or that episode. So please, please, if there's something that you would like to have a little bit more detail on, on or maybe a specific question, then just pop on in and we will do our best to answer it and help you out with it. I'll start today by showing you what I'm wearing and talking about it and the fact that um, apparently while I love the sweater, I realize that my choice of garment underneath is not ideal. Under normal circumstances, one of my favorite summer outfits are these kind of t-shirt dresses, just tend to be A-line, very loosely fit, and they can be worn by themselves. So if it's hot weather, you can leave your leggings off and just wear the t-shirt dress with a pair of sandals, it's perfect. And it's easy to kind of keep upping it so that you get a bit of extended use with it because like right now it's a little bit cooler. So first thing I've done is I've added a pair of leggings underneath and a pair of runners, which you call them in Ireland, sneakers in the States. And I've added the extra layer on top, which is my soft trail sweater. And it's really, really good for um, any kind of dresses really, but I find particularly this kind of t-shirty style because what it is, is it's, a cropped style but not super cropped because cropped I would very often associate with being maybe this kind of length whereas I find that it's a little short and it means that you're only able to use it in um, circumstances where you've got a dress underneath but this one that's slightly cropped I can wear this with a pair of jeans because it sits just about at where the belt would be or I can, it's still short enough that if you wear it over a dress, it allows the dress to kind of slide out a bit on each side like this. Whereas if it's longer, it just doesn't look quite as well because the dress gets a bit obscured. And if there's any bit of a flare to the dress, it's kind of trapped a little bit under the sweater. So these boxy, slightly cropped sweaters have many, many uses that I would never have thought of before because it's only the last couple of years that I've started designing and knitting that kind of style and I'm realizing that it's really, really multifunctional. But the reason that I'm not terribly coordinated today is because of what I'm wearing underneath because this is open work lace down the side. Probably works better with the solid sweater because you can see the stripes underneath, but it still works. And if you're looking at me straight on, you're probably not gonna see the stripes too much, right? So I'm just gonna ignore the stripes because it's very comfortable and just the right temperature for today in our June, Ireland, not that warm. So, but that's, that's what I'm wearing. And that's my thinking on this type of sweater and why I've started knitting more and more of them. So there was a couple of questions came in over the last week or two that we thought would make really good topics that I can kind of expand a little on to talk about different areas of knitting and yarn and things like that. So the first one came from Jean. She said she um, loved the show on substituting yarns and she'd like to see a little bit more, particularly she has got lace weight yarn for summer drops enough to hold it too stranded and she wanted to know if that would work for um, for the getting the gauge. So I thought it would make a very, very good topic where I can talk about substituting yarns and also figuring out if you're holding yarns two together, what's the best way of deciding how that's going to work. The most foolproof way of knowing if yarns, whether held singly or held doubly is going to work is always going to be swatching. 
So if in doubt, swatch, because that will give you a definitive answer. But it is helpful to have a few rules of thumb in place so that when you're holding the yarns or you're trying to figure out what's going to work in your stash, you've got an idea of how it's going to work. Um, but it's not just the weight. There's also how it's spun and what it actually looks like because fibers and the way yarns are milled varies a lot. There's huge, huge variations. And that means that it also impacts how it's going to block and how it's going to be knit. And as a designer, I may use a yarn in a very different way than, um, than the yarn was perhaps initially intended particularly like the summer drops one that Jean was talking about is a very, very good case in point because that uses what is on paper a, um, I think it's a fingering weight or a light sports weight yarn and it's a rustic slubby silk. And um, that means that it's quite heavy and it's got a huge amount of drape. And I discovered when I was knitting it because it's quite an unusual yarn, but when I was knitting up with it, um, it, was very happy to be knit loosely. When I knitted loosely, instead of having loose sloppy stitches, it just added to the drape and it looked, it actually looked quite attractive. So I knit that loosely to give a more open weave for the fabric for summertime to make it more comfortable and to add to the drape. But what that means is if you went and you looked at just the the name of the yarn saying oh it says it's a fingering weight yarn and you went and you found another fingering four ply sock yarn and you try to use it you are not necessarily going to get the same results because if it's a different fiber and a different um blend of of yarn and spun differently knitting it that loosely will potentially look very sloppy or it may not even work. You could keep up in the needle size and you may still not actually get close to the to the stitch gauge on it. So the, the that yarn is particularly unusual, but it does mean that um, if you know the intention of me as a designer, which is it's knit a little bit loosely and it wants a lot of drape, then you're going to, you can maybe then match it up with the kind of fibers you have so that if you've got yarns that has some silk or some linen or maybe some cotton, you can start swatching those and perhaps do a combination of maybe a fingering weight with something that has a little bit of drape and seeing what those look like. So the, the way the yarn behaves is really, really important that it's not all just about what the weight of the yarn is. But that kind of leads me then on to taking a look at other ways that you can figure out how you can combine yarns. Like bear in mind, like swatching is important. Looking at the fiber content is important. But then if what you've got is the same type of yarn, say it's wool, a wool fiber in, in the actual design, and it is a worsted spun. So very smooth yarn in the design, but you don't have that weight. And you're trying to figure out, I have lots of woolly yarns here. What two can I hold together to make it work? For that, you're going to probably want to start looking at um, something that is used quite a lot by spinners, which is WPI, wraps per inch. And that is exactly like what it sounds like. What you're looking at is you can take either a ruler or the, you can also get a specific tool for it, which is just a groove cut out in a little bit of wood, usually wood. You can probably get it in other fiber materials as well, just measuring an inch. And it's exactly like what it sounds like. You wrap your yarn around the, the ruler or the tool um, for, for measuring your wraps per inch. You want each strand as you wrap it to um, be touching snugly with the one next to it, but not crossing over. So you do want them touching and you want to have them kind of comfortably in, but not squished. So what the, the kind of the, the spacing that comes na as naturally as possible for that yarn. And then you're going to measure how many of those wraps or strands as it pass across in, this, in the space of one inch. And what that will tell you is it gives you an estimate as to where in the categorization of yarn you're going to be, everything from a lace weight up to a super chunky. The reason it's so important for spinners is when you spin a yarn, you don't, it doesn't come with the yarn label. And so you need to be able to figure out where does this fit so that I can use it within patterns and I get an idea of what needle size is going to work best as a starting point and things like that. 
Now I'm going to, I've got a, my little list here of wraps for inches because I do not know this off by heart. Um, and we start first of all with lace weight. So this one is cumulus and the fiber on this is quite different and you can, I don't know if, how well you can see, it is, it's a brushed yarn, which means it's very, very fluffy. And when you're using that, what that will mean is you can work it very loosely because you can make the stitches very loose and all of the halo and the fluff from that, it's actually fluff flying through the air here from it, um, the fluff from that is going to fill in the stitches. So it works really, really well, loosely knit, but it doesn't look like it's a very, it doesn't look terribly open. And it's, it's so it's very, it's a very, very useful yarn for knitting loose, loose fabrics while still having a nice cohesive, attractive looking fabric. It is also on the heavier weight. I don't, I haven't done um, a wraps per inch test on it, but I suspect it's going to be on the lower end of the category. Normally for lace weight, it's going to be 25 wraps plus. So anything above that, you're going to be categorizing as a lace weight, which obviously has a huge range in it because this would be a heavier lace weight. It's going to go right up to the cobwebs, which you'd barely see. So with those, I'd say you could be ending up with like double what you have on this. Uh, but that is what you're going to do. You wrap them around, you count each of those strands in your inch. And if you've got over 25 strands in that one inch, then it goes into the lace weight category. The next one along is going to be the fingering weight, which is also known as sock yarn or in the UK, sometimes known as four ply. So that would be the next step along. And that again comes, this comes in quite a big range. For those you're looking at anything between 18 to 22 wraps per inch. And that will be, so if you've got 18, it's going to be a heavier sock weight. 22, it's going to be a lighter weight one. And this one here, this is a sock yarn, socks yeah from Koopsnitz. And it's, it, it's a little on the lighter side is what I would kind of categorize this as. Um, and you can just wrap those along and you can tell where it is on the, in the range based on the, on, on the wraps. Next size along is going to be sports weight. And this one falls, the wraps per inch for that is 15 to, am I right in that? 15 to 20 wraps per inch. This one is uh, my newest sport and it's actually on the heavier end of it. So you're probably going to be close, a little closer to your 15 is my suspicion with this one. But you'll, you'll notice that the sock one went 18 to 22, but the sports weight was 15 to 20. So you've, act, hang on a second. Yeah. So you've got, you've got a, a crossover there between the two, between your 15 and 18, you've got a double classification on the bottom end and we'll have the same on the upper end again and that's where some of the difficulties end up when people are trying to figure out what weight a yarn is because there's in the middle sections they can actually be put into either category and you can see how that ends up to a lot of confusion so a heavy sock weight yarn is going to be very similar to a lightweight sports weight yarn and on the other end a heavier sports weight will fall into a lighter DK. So a lot of them have almost double categories and it's very useful to be able to know that because it means that when you go and you're trying to figure out, you know that just taking the yarn name saying, oh, it's a fingering weight yarn, that only gives you a very small bit of information. You want to look at the gauge, the suggested needle size, and you, you can also look at like the yardage of it is helpful, um, but the yardage can also be a little deceptive because different types of milling and different fibers will have very different yardages. So a woolen spun it was going to have much more yardage because it has a lot of air trapped into it. And the same on the other end, a worsted spun is going to have less yardage, even though it'll give you the same stitch count because it's much denser. So the, um, there, there's big variations, but the wrapper inch is quite helpful because it gives you the, the width or the thickness of the yarn. So that was your sports weight and that was 15 to 20. Next one up is DK, which is 13 to 17. And this one is Blasta and that's DK. 
and that again is a little on the heavier weight and in fact this is going to if if i was selling this in the us primarily i'd probably be almost inclined to put it into a worsted weight category but in the in the uk and in ireland sports weight and worsted weight aren't very common so it tends to be dk um, straight into iron weight and that middle category of worsted is much much less common here obviously yarns that are imported will stay as worsted weight but as a general rule most of the mills over here wouldn't tend to categorize things in worsted weight so with the with this one your dk it would be 13 to 17 wraps per inch and what that is going to actually give you then is you can see your on the upper end where you've got it starts at 17 but the sport goes down as far as 15 so you've got between 15 and 17 they can be categorized in either area as well so it's it's definitely um it's a good starting point but it also makes it very very clear that there is a lot of gray and that's why swatching is important because you can see what the gauge is and put that together with whether you like the fabric. If the fabric is too tight but you get gauge, that's really not very useful because it's going to be too stiff, it won't be pliable and won't be comfortable to knit with. Or on the other end, if you get gauge but it's really loose and floppy and holy and your stitches are uneven, that's equally well not very useful. So the quality of the fabric is as important as getting the gauge and don't let getting the gauge supersede um, what the fabric feels like that they both have to be taken into consideration when you're figuring out substitutions the last one here that I had was um, the worsted weight um, this is my worsted weight from NUA and that in wraps per inch is going to be 11 to 15 again with the DK it came down to 13 so you've got 13 to 15 can either be DK or which would be double knitting um, or it can be worsted so just like with the others you've got those little overlaps in between where they can kind of go on either end and you will get used to it as you're knitting yourself and you get used to handling more yarns and you've got more samples to test from and things like that you'll get a much clearer picture when you pick things up and you feel it and you start knitting you'll know where and the in the family of yarn that it's put on it actually fits that you know that yes it is a worsted but it feels like it's on the heavier weight of worsted so that, that definitely comes with practice and with swatching and with experience. That's the initial part of what I was talking about because of course the question that we originally started from Jean was how do you hold two together? And that's why I started on my whole wraps per inch story because wraps per inch, I've been talking about it as just using single strands of yarn. But if you're going to be doing something double stranded, you can take your double strands and wrap and figure out for a starting point where those double strands fit. Obviously you count those two together as one so if you wrap them around and you get 12 then you go take a look and you go okay so if it's 12 wraps per inch that fits pretty well into my worsted category is that what I need for my pattern and you can kind of you know that you're probably in a good place to to try and go match up so you can use the wraps per inch as a tool for substituting single strands of yarn with double strands of yarn and it means that before you ever knit anything you can take a couple of yarns like that where you can double strand it and see roughly how many wraps for the two of those am I getting so if you wrapped um, a lace weight yarn and you're getting um, we'll say uh, 40 wraps for that and you are planning on holding a double then you can probably work in the assumption well where does my 20 come have a look that falls into the sock yarn category it's probably going to give me a pretty good estimate a close approximation and you can swatch it up and you can test to see if the gauge matches up but it gives you that starting point where you at least can make an initial educated guess as to whether it's going to fit into the um, whether it's going to work for what you're doing so that was our first question which I gave an extremely long-winded reply to but hopefully it's enough information that it moves a little beyond that one reply and can be extrapolated and used for a lot of different situations as well. Next question we had was from Claire and she'd like me to talk more about 
how you change a neckline, uh, a neckline for top-down garments. She hates things riding up in her neck and she's always trying to widen and lower the neckline. I feel like every one of my answers today is going to be an it depends, but this is another it depends um, answer because it's not a one size fits all. There are many, many different types of garment construction. And I think it was in lesson one, I was talking about different garment constructions. Um, and specifically, I was um, talking about like, uh, this is a drop shoulder construction, which is going to have the shoulder part up here. It's going to be very similar to set and sleeve or saddle shoulder. And then something like a circular yoke or a raglan is different again, because your shoulders come all the way up to to the rather your your arms continue all the way up to here and so changes you make to the neck will have a very different impact going down as i'm wearing this one i'll start with this to kind of describe how you would make adjustments for something like this which is drop shoulder so what you have with this is Drop shoulder is more or less a square with a little bit of, of shaping at the shoulder to create a slope at the top. But because the shoulders sit right here, widening the neck opening isn't going to have a significant impact on lowering the front of the neck because this part will still sit here. It's just going to make the neck opening come out wider. So that for this type garment isn't going to be very helpful. But what you want to do if you want to make the neck opening deeper in the front is you can drop it. It's quite straightforward really because it's knit from the top down so you've done the back and then you come back to knit the front. Initially you come straight for a little bit while you're doing the short rows and then because this is a high circular it very quickly starts doing the uh, increases down along here. If you want it deeper you'll just keep going straight for a little bit longer and then you'll start doing your increases and that will mean that the front of it is going to drop down. I like, I don't like obviously the front of it being too high, it's never very comfortable, but alternatively, I really, really hate the back of my neck being cold. So I quite like um, a higher back of neck. And so with that, what you can do with this is you work short rows back and forth. So the back goes up a little bit higher and that also helps because it means that relatively speaking, the back is higher and the front is lower because you're raising the back up. So you can do the two at the same time, raise the back up, and also drop a little bit down the front and the two combined means that you get a nice difference between the front and the back as it fits better, it's more comfortable to wear and it's, uh, yeah, it just looks well, but it's very, it is an easy one to change on either drop shoulder or set in sleeves. And the other one that I was talking about was kind of raglan or circular yoke, but I need to go get a sample. So if you all hang right here for two seconds, I'm going to run off and grab a, sh a sample that I can describe what's happening with it. All right, I have now gone and got my Glen Barrow. This one is a raglan sweater and it's knit from the top down. It's got quite an open neckline, um, even made more so because of the fact that there's no edging. It's just cast on and then worked down and there was no edging finished with that. So it was designed to have quite an open feel of a neck. You can see also here where the sleeves come all the way up to the top and all the way up here. And in this case, if you want to drop the whole thing further down, when you cast on, you want more stitches because the um, a raglan or a um, circular yoke, it's almost like a funnel. So the bottom part is the widest and the top part is narrowest. When you're putting it on your body, it's going to stop at the place where the funnel ends or where the neckline is. So if you've got a small neck and you slide it on, it's going to sit further up. If you've got a wider neck, it's going to slide further down. That is going to have a lot of other impacts on how it's worn as well, because the wider the neck, particularly if you increase the neck size relative to the rest of the body, it's going to slide further down. When something is worn further down, it also means that this starts further out on the body and this is going to sit further down as well. So you, you, I would suggest if you do increase that neck, you're going to want to decrease the raglan or the, the yoke depth because otherwise the underarm is going to sit too far down and you'll even get the sleeve sitting further down because everything has slid further down that funnel, which is your neck. 
you can also, if you've done something and you weren't sure what you wanted to look like, you're almost better off starting with the slightly wider opening because it's much easier to tighten it up than it is to loosen. Because if we started with this, and you decided, oh, it's sitting too far down. I don't like the way it feels. You can just pick up stitches and by adding on neck edging, either in like a tight ribbing, ideally with a, um, a tighter gauge or, you know, smaller needle size, and then even doing a, um, a kind of a snugger bind off at the end. It's going to pull the whole thing in. And in fact, particularly if you have a tighter bind off, it's going to, in fact, pull it up the body. And there's been times when I've had knitters who've had, where they said their armhole was way too deep, the sleeves were too long, and they had been talking about, you know, changing the, the length of this and figuring out how to change this. And if I got them to actually stand back and look at it and look at the, the, the sweater as, as a whole, rather than just the parts, that they were, they were noticing with it, it meant that it, they started seeing that it all came from the shoulder, from the neck, that the neck was too wide, which meant everything slid further down by either doing a very slight, you could do it very slightly where you do just a very snug crochet chain along here, which would pull it up and tighten it. I-cord edging is perfect if you want something that you don't want to change the look very much, but you want to snug it up. And I-cord edging along there works really well. They'll pull it all up. Snug up the neck means that it doesn't stretch out as much or slide down the body. And that meant that it pulled the armhole up, it pulled the sleeves up, and just changing the neckline meant that everything else got pulled up a little bit as well. In the case of Jean, oh sorry, Claire, Becky Pardon, Claire, um, you want to do the opposite because you want it looser. So you want to start with more stitches. Just keep in mind that if you do that, you don't want, you will possibly need to decrease the yoke and decrease the sleeve length because everything else is going to slide a little bit further down. So with the raglan and circular yokes, neck de neckline decisions will have knock-on implications. There, it's not quite the same thing, but you can also, as I was talking about with short rows, you can see as well here, back of this is a little bit higher than the front, and that is done in the same way, but you actually start in the short rows a bit further over. So it kind of starts quite far up here. I think it was, yeah, it was in the middle here before the stitch pattern started. And that meant that it kind of shaped this and left it a bit lower, but kept the back up a little bit higher. You can kind of see the difference in the two here. There's a couple of inches in height difference, and that's all done with short rows, but they come quite far up the front so that it makes a much more of a neck shaping rather than just the back coming up a little. So that's, that's how you would go about changing something like this for um, raglan, and we described it on this. So it's pretty straightforward to change the necks. You just need to know how the construction is put together and make sure it doesn't have other implications further down the line in terms of the rest of the body shaping. Um, I hope you enjoyed all of our discussion about yarns and necklines today. If you have questions that you want me to answer or you'd like to put into a future episode, it would be fantastic if you pop them up here. It's really helpful because it gives me a starting point and it means that I am producing and talking about stuff that you want to hear about. So please do put up the comments. I love, love, love knowing what, you, what you'd like to know more about. So come join me on our next episode. Should be in two weeks time. Um, and thanks for joining me today.